And at this point, they have a common position towards non-member states, countries that are not within the European Union. Even if they are European nations, they have specific uh, you know, policies towards them. Then they moved down to a customs union, where in addition to abolishing tariffs, they also allow the movement of capital and labor. So there's a free movement of labor and capital within the system. That's a higher. Now, one thing you have to notice is that each other stage embodies the previous one. Each other stage is an embodiment of the previous ones. And it's a higher stage. So at this stage, there's a free movement of labor. Now, you have to, that is why the Europeans were trying to make this criteria of, of, of convergence to be part of the union, your unemployed population should not be said 45%. Once you have 45% and over of your population as unemployed, you don't qualify. Because if Gambia or Kivet is doing well, the currency is stronger. I've seen that it's stronger than many other countries. And so if there's a free movement of capital and labor, then many very qualified people will come from Ghana, Nigeria, Africa to this country, and then the unemployed will begin to rise again. You see? So the free movement of labor and capital are important for uh, nations that are weak, nations where unemployment is high. Now, what do we do? Even if unemployment in one country is not that high, but there's a threat of <coughs> foreigners taking their jobs, then the group will have to decide that, for example, direct foreign investment coming to the Union a third will go to this country. Or there's an European fund established which will be supportive of weaker economies. Without that, some other UK economies may want to stay away. You know. And so economic, economic integration, it's a very serious, long-term, difficult process. And nations would have to declare their intentions and their motives very clearly and well spread out. And Europe was able to do that. To, to bring everybody on board, you needed to really make the terms as clear as possible so that there's no ambiguity, things are not ambiguous, to push other countries out. Now, right from the common market, uh, the customs, uh, uh, yeah, for the custom union, it comes to the common market, right? And the common market, I was reading something this morning. Well, it simply says that the customs union, in addition to the movement of capital and labor. So, I mean, if uh, I was going to Nigeria and I don't, have, I don't need a visa, but I go to Abuja and then they give me the, uh, the stamp and then you are told that you cannot take job while here. When I was coming here, it was the same thing. I can stay for 90 days, but I cannot take paid job. No. So there's no freedom of movement of labor from one country to the other, unless a, a business or a company wants you, which is a specific demand made. Then from there, you move on to the economic union. And that is the highest stage of the integration, where Europe is now. And with the economic union, 
is quite interesting. You have the common market, you have a common currency, so you have the euro. And at that point, within all the countries, they try to harmonize. There is harmonization of economic, political, and social policies. They try to harmonize it. So the policies being pursued by France, Germany, and all these other countries are harmonized. And if you are, for example, uh, from France, and you move to Germany, and you are not working, you are entitled to income support, you are entitled to all uh, social benefits, you can vote, and all that. And so, at that point, the nations would have moved gradually to a point where they are virtually on the verge of political unification. Because at that point, when the right to print your own money is taken from you, when you harmonize everything, when you have a common market, no tariffs and all that, then naturally and logically, the political institutions will develop to make decisions, which is where Europe is at the moment. Now, there is something artificial about the African attempt at integration. We try to create a continental government, jumping. Now, when we don't have a common market, we have custom union, we've not tried any of these things. And that is the problem, because Africa was being pushed. Africa was being pushed. I think it is feasible, it is very feasible for Africa to eventually create a political union. But that will take a long time, and it has to proceed gradually from one process to the other. Of course, taking into consideration the kinds of things we mentioned, education and uh, you know, information and all that. The question is, do you think as students of integration, do you think that this model is suitable for Africa? Do you think Africa needs its own unique processes of integration? Can Africa go through these same processes that Europe has gone through? That's my question for you. What stops Africa from going through these processes? Even with Europe, with the experience and all that, moving from the economic union to the political union finally is being hectic for them. There are some countries where you have strong domestic opposition to further union within the countries. In France, for example, all the nationalist parties of Europe, you know, are doing that. So can Africa go through such processes? Is it conceivable? What stops Africa from doing that? Is this narrative feasible in the African circumstances. This is what I want you to think seriously about. You ask about the free trade zone. Is it working? Well, there are there are there are informal informal free trade zones in Africa, where Nigerians smuggle goods 
to Ghana through the bush, and Ghanaians also smuggle goods, and people are doing their own things, you know. So there are processes of informalization, you know. But at the state level, and legally speaking, is it happening? Is it feasible? Um, the United States, South Africa, they also defended the system 